it's like I said, I think a lot of times it's not just about doing a brand new trick every week and therefore you're the legends of skateboarding because you've been able to progress it in that way. There's other sides to it. It's a creative outlet. People are supposed to be inspired by what professional skateboarders do more than anything. They're supposed to be inspired and they're supposed to want to continue to pass that along to the next generation. And the fact that Eric's around now and he's tattooing right here on Fairfax in LA, pro skaters and like young skate kids, and as humble as you could possibly be. Not every pro skater that you meet as you're growing up ends up being the whole time that they're around, that, that inspirational character. And there's very few of them. And I think Eric deserves like a huge amount of respect for that. What's up? Welcome back to Epically Later. This uh, episode is about Eric Dressen. Um, I'm really excited because I feel like this show has primarily focused on the, the eras that, you know, I kind of started skating in, which was like the 90s, 2000s. I really wanted to kind of like jump back a couple years. So I thought it'd be sick to do an episode on Eric Dressen. He goes back further than almost anyone that's in skateboarding or started entering pro contests in the late 70s. In the 80s, he was like slaying street contests, winning everything. Right up there with Nottis, Gons, Tommy Guerrero. He's got so much influence on the way people skate now. And then even to this day, he's still super on point with skating. I'm really stoked to share that story with you guys. And this is it. The Eric Dressen, Epically Later. Hope you enjoy it. been tattooing for the last eight years now and it's the last year and a half I've been here on Fairfax at Will Rise next to Supreme and, and Known Gallery and Diamond and Hundreds. It's been like one of the best things ever happened to me. Can you show him my tattoo? I did your ribs? Look, he did this like shit. Funny. He did that. <laughs> Wait, he got me too. He got me good. He got me good. It's kind of rad down here. I talk to so many people every day, and I'm like one of the shyest per people you ever met. And from being down here and just walking out and like talking to everybody, I came out of my shell. It's funny now, I'll talk to anybody now. The one thing that personifies Dresden's character so much is, you know, the Supreme Store with the bowl has been here since 2005. And to this day, Eric will still come in, walk to the register, and ask if he can skate the bowl. Dressen made a mark in skateboarding history, and he is an entity in this industry you can't fuck with. He's like a 5.0 Mustang. The motherfucker's small, short, and stubby, but he's all muscle, just all engine. You know what I mean? I compare him to fast cars, because when we skated, he was about velocity and fast. Never did anything half-ass and always did shit hardcore. When it came to skateboarding, motherfucker had bigger balls than all of us. You don't live here anymore? I just keep my stuff here pretty much. I live with my girlfriend. We don't have storage here, so I just threw everything in here. My dad worked for the Freeformer skateboards. I used to test ride these little yellow boards and I'd try them out and see how much I could wear it out in like a day. So your dad was into skateboarding sort of? Yeah, well my dad, that's the first guy I ever saw skateboard was my dad, but it was just, you know, 70, probably three or four, or first time I ever saw somebody skateboard. My dad and my mom pretty much split up when I was six months old. And uh, I was pretty much just on my own, you know, like, like uh, I didn't really have a, a mom, so like, you know, I, I could just go and leave and come and go as I please. When I was six, my dad got me this motorcycle for my birthday, this Indian Mini Mini 50. And on that day, I decided I was a grown up. I was no longer gonna be a little kid. I threw away all my toys. I moved to Las Vegas with my grandma, and we lived right by the desert, and I taught myself how to ride motorcycle, how to jump. I was ripping it up, and I'd seen like some dirt bikers out there, and they had long hair, so I decided I'm gonna have long hair, grew my hair out. 
maybe a little short after that, I saw uh, Endless Summer, and I wanted to be a surfer. Everyone told me, oh, you gotta learn how to skateboard first. So I'd just come home from school and I'd just skate, clay wheels, I'd ride around in my OP shorts. Back then, like, this is what surfers did when there wasn't waves or just to get around. And then one day I walked into Jacob's Surf Shop in Hermosa and I saw Skateboarder Magazine on the counter. First issue of Greg Weaver on the cover. And from that on, I was like, boom. I was gonna be a pro skateboarder. It was a life or death. Logan, Bain, and GNS, and Sims were like the top companies, and Hobie. But I wanted to ride for Logan. You could compare Logan Erski to Girl. Yeah. Like in their day, yeah, they, they kind of, you know, they were one of the better teams. They had the Logan family. They were unbelievable freestyle riders from Encinitas, California, and they did their own boards, and they had like these solid oak plank, three-quarter inch with uh, wedge tails glued on skateboards. They were really heavy. After the Zephyr team, they had Tony Alva riding for them. They had Bobby Biniak riding for them. If you skateboarded at that time, it was the top professional brand. I just remember Logan being the first that branded boards with riders' names, and there was a whole list of them. Bruce Logan, Brad Logan, Robin Logan, Laura Thornhill, Bob Beniak. It was not only something that we were doing because we had so much passion for it, but it was a means of transportation as well, and it was a lifestyle. So it was an amazing cast of people and characters. I remember meeting Eric and his dad, and he was just this little shredder kid, blonde-haired, cutie pie, and everyone just ate him up. If you fell and totally ate shit, you'd get right back up and hit it even harder. He just always had this relentless go-for-it style and attitude. He was a rock star from, from the get-go, for sure. I guess I was pretty good for my age then. I was like nine years old, 10 years old. And she asked me if I wanted to be on Logan. I got on Logan and they would just send me packages. And I get like pulled from class like in the fourth grade and then be like Bruce Logan calling me and see if I wanted to go skate somewhere. Yeah. And I was like, my dad's at work. I, don't, I can't get to San Diego right now. <laughs> yeah. Eric was like the ripping little kid. Back then it was a little bit more odd because there weren't as many kids, but he had really good style and mad talents and he was always a pretty even killed kid. It was like a little skate park in Torrance and uh, me and Laura Thornhill showed up to skate. I look on top of the hill of the skate park and there's Tony Alva getting interviewed because he was about to come out with that Leaf Garrett movie, Skateboard. And I'm all, there's my hero up there. It was like the sun and the moon, everything aligned and I was under the same sky with Tony Alva and all I wanted to hear was what his voice sounded like. You could build such a big pool I mean, it's, it's... Back then, the only fun. time you got to see Tony Alva was like in the magazines. It was never on TV and didn't have videos back then. That's how I learned how to skateboard, I was just looking at pictures and I just have that one still or a sequence and I just tried to emulate their style. I could like go up and kick turn like this dude or do something like that dude. Like I was always em just emulating. I was still playing with G.I. Joes and this kid's doing frontside grinds. Yeah. Like that's the fucking reality of it. I remember seeing him in mags and thinking how fucking cool, you know, as you'd open up the skateboarder and you'd go back to see who got who's hots in the back. Because like those were the guys that were fucking coming up. And he looked like a little surf kid, you know, and he was a super skinny board. I think he was doing like a frontside attack, like whipping one in like a snake run. I mean, that was what was fucking awesome about it. Like there was just a handful of like actual kids that were getting coverage. And that was like, fuck, we can do this too. Wow, a 10 year old kid that gets to skate with the right guys. Who is he? Where is he from? I just remember there was like probably half a year where you see, you saw probably, I probably saw three full page photos and uh, a who's hot. I always felt like I was the young skater of my group, but my group wasn't in the mags. Kind of, you know what I mean? <laughs> kind of thing, you know? So I was this kid going, oh, I wish I was that kid with those guys. I was getting paid, even as an amateur, like Excalibur Trucks paid me like a salary and he gave me like contest incentives and stuff. Like if I won a contest, I got like a hundred bucks. So I did pretty good this one summer. I was getting like 300 bucks a month. Plus every Friday at Skateboard World, they had a contest and I won like every contest like back then <laughs> for my age group. 
you know, so like 10 and under. So I did, I was doing pretty good back then. Top dog, Tony Alva, sets up a competition. Alva came out with the Alva skates and my dad was renting a little house right down the street from Kinner Canyon School. So that was the summer of 78. I kind of just met up with Alva one day and started hanging out with him and I got on Alva then, which was a, the dream come true because I was like the baddest company, you know. Marina Del Rey opened and I was like, first one there, two weeks before it opened, sneaking in the side of the gate to get in to watch like Tony Alva, Jay Adams, private session. Like me and Aaron Murray were like these little kids that couldn't even skate deep bowls yet. We couldn't even ride a pool. We were just riding little bowls. And I think it was the Gyro Dog Bowl Pro Contest happened. And then here came Eric Dressen. He's pro in the contest. Now this is the first time I ever seen him. And he's in there doing wheelers, little airs, and ollies over the hip. Just like he's like D style. You know what I mean? Full on like this, just super sick, but he was 10 and, I, and me and Murray were like, this 10 year old is ripping. And it was so inspiring for us because it made us have hope that, you know, we could rip right now. We don't have to wait till we get bigger. Now it's my local park and I did pretty good. I got like 24th out of 40 or 48 people. I just missed the cut by like four people. And that was like an AM contest? It was a pro contest. Technically, I was professional. You know, that's all I wanted to do was be a pro skateboarder. That was it. And uh, my dream was to get Who's Hot, be on Logan, and meet Tony Alva and hear what his voice sounded like. And you made all that happen. Aww. That is beautiful. Aww. Cut. <laughs> <laughs>